You guys remember that whole squad goals thing? Anyway, it was the hopes and dreams that one day we could have a group of friends to do some incredible things with. Or it was the incredible things that we hoped one day our group of friends would be able to accomplish and do together. If you search the hashtag squad goals, you'll, you'll find hundreds of thousands of people aiming to have the types of friendships and experiences that make others envious. We can relate because we're wired for this. We want to be part of something, belong to a community that's actually doing things, that's part of things, that's going somewhere. We long for it. When we have amazing experiences, we want others from our squad to come back and experience it with us. I mean, how many times have you found yourself saying, oh man, I wish so-and-so were here. I recently got Snapchat on my phone, mainly because I wanted to try and keep up and understand what this world so many of you guys are living in is like. Snapchat isn't a thing anymore? Wasn't this at least the point of Snapchat? It was just to let your squad know where you were and what you were doing in that moment. We're beginning our series on relationships, and this week we're gonna have a conversation around this idea of friendships. And in specific, we're gonna look at a moment that took place that's well worthy of the hashtag squad goals. So here's the deal. Our dream for you guys is that you would see the incredible opportunity for relationships and community that's available to you in your small groups. That you would see this squad of people around you that you spend time with every week as integral to your faith journey. And that you would start to truly invest in it and be intentional as a community for the sake of one another. So here's the big idea. Find a squad and be a squad that brings one another to Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles or your devices and open them up to Mark chapter 2. And we're going to dive into this story together. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, ah, let's pause there. I love this. I mean, hashtag squad goals, am I right? You have this helpless friend, paralyzed, unable to walk, and he hears, or collectively you as a squad, you hear that this guy Jesus is back home. And you've heard and you know what he's been up to and that he's been moving and performing these miracles. And so you decide, we gotta get our friend there to see him because this might be our only chance and our only hope that our friend will be able to walk again. And so what do they do? They pick him up on his little cot and they carry him to the house. Who knows how long or how far the journey would have been, but it would have been work, a grown man on more than likely a straw mat who's a total and absolute dead weight. They grab him and they move him to the house. But then they get to the neighborhood, and from a long way out they can see that the place is swarmed. People are everywhere. It's hard enough for a single person to weave through the crowd, let alone a squad carrying someone on a mat. But they manage to get close enough and again only discover that the house is already full. It's packed, there's no more room. 
Not full as in it would be a little bit cramped if we got in there as well, but full as in people would have had already been on top of one another in order to be where Jesus was. And so imagine yourself there. You've come so far. You've worked so hard. You know that the one person who can make your friend whole again is sitting just beyond those walls. And rather than be discouraged or demanding of everyone else who's there, they get really creative and they improvise. Why? Because it mattered enough to them. And their improvisation strategy? They climb up and they drag their paralyzed friend onto the roof, pound and tear a hole through the roof of the house, and most likely using their robes and other items of clothing, lower their paralyzed friend down in front of Jesus himself. I mean, isn't this insane? Someone actually lived in that house. They would have to sleep in that house later that night, and now they have a man-sized hole in the roof where some dude and his friend were mission impossible down into the living room. This tells me two things. First, these friends understood the radical power that Jesus had to transform their friend. They had a radical vision of who Jesus was. And second, they loved their friend enough to do whatever it took to bring him to Jesus. Now, I want you to honestly pause here for just a moment and imagine your primary circle of friends. And with all honesty, I want you to imagine yourself as the paralytic. Would the people around you have done the same thing for you? Would you have done it for your friends? Do you love your friends enough to do whatever it takes to bring them to Jesus? So the story goes on. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Now, there's lots we could say about this second half of the story, about the power of Jesus, about his absolute authority over medicine, but also over the entire universe and his ability to forgive sins and even read minds. But I wanna focus in on a different, bigger point. You see, when it comes to the miracles of healing that Jesus performed and that were recorded for us in the Bible, we find, and this is always the case, that they're entirely symbolic of a need for a spiritual healing. Now don't get me wrong, these physical healings did actually take place. Jesus actually healed those with leprosy and blindness and paralysis and illness and even death. But in doing so, he was, and the authors who recorded these things, were pointing towards a symbolic spiritual healing that needed to take place in all of us as well. The healing of the blind man was evidence of the fact that spiritually we're all born blind, unable to see and understand the bigger picture of the universe at work behind the scenes. And Jesus comes to give us sight and vision and understanding of this world. The raising to life of Lazarus revealed for us that we're all dead and needing to be raised to a new life in Jesus. And it also pointed towards a final raising to life after physical death. The same is true with the healing of the paralytic. We see this in Jesus' interaction with the man. Uh, just look at verse 5 again. It says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. I mean, this is the first thing Jesus says and does for this man. Forgive his sins. After all the work that the squad had gone through, after clearly seeing this man was unable to move on his own, Jesus offers to forgive his sins. Why? Because Jesus is teaching and showing that a life with him is what truly matters. The ability to walk is meaningless unless he's walking with and towards Jesus. The first and most primary necessity for this man wasn't the ability to stand again, but was to be made right in the presence of God. That's what Jesus offers this man, and that's what's offered to us as well. 
like this man, we too can find ourselves as paralyzed. We live our life like those dreams you have. You know the ones where you're trying to get away from something or get to something and you're just stuck, you're immobilized, you're unable to run or even move. That's us, going nowhere. And Jesus offers to us the ability to make fully whole and run. The physical healing of the paralytic was used to show the spiritual healing needed by him and by everyone else in the room and by us now together reading and hearing about this story today. It's the invitation to be made right and whole by God. And it's a promise that a life like that with and through God is a life unlike anything you will ever have experienced or ever will experience. We see this at the end of the story in verse 12. It says, and the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Again, our dream is that the life you guys would come to taste and experience and live into is a life with Jesus that nothing other than Jesus and the life he promises you can ever fully satisfy you. And our heart is that in and through your communities, you would chase after this with total and full abandon. That it wouldn't matter the personal cost, whether it be status or what others might think of us or time or energy or resources, but that nothing would matter more to us than helping one another get closer to the person of Jesus. So friends, hear me again. Find a squad and be a squad that brings one another to Jesus. I mean, if you're really honest with yourselves, isn't this deep down what we all want? As a youth ministry, our team doesn't spend a lot of time and resources on big, loud, flashy events. We just don't see the real need and value in them. Now, we'll do things for sure that, that help us make memories and have lots of fun, but our number one priority is that you would be in a small group, a community, with a good, strong, caring adult leader to walk alongside of you. To us, nothing else matters. We could strip away the pizza, the dodgeball, the conferences, the singing, even the video games. The most important part of your experience in our youth ministry is not that you showed up to something big, but that you were known and cared for by a group that is small. Our dream and vision is that in and through your community, you would find people and be people who would bring one another to Jesus. Find a squad and be a squad that brings one another to Jesus. That's what the story's all about. It's about a community of people who deeply loved one another, a band of brothers who were willing to serve one another in any way possible with the goal of making sure that they could and would bring one another to the person of Jesus. And so my question for you to think about is are you a part of a squad that would do this for one another? Would you do whatever it takes, regardless of the cost and time, to bring one another to the person of Jesus? Andy Stanley puts it like this, the people who surround you are a preview of the future you. That it matters for you to think about and really evaluate the crew that you put into your life because it will actually affect the trajectory of your life. And so I will tell you unashamedly, friends, choose well. Are you part of a squad that would do this for one another? Would you do whatever it takes, regardless of the cost and time, to bring one another to the person of Jesus? And if you answer no to that question, because the friends you surround yourself are not helping you get closer to Jesus, then my question is, why are you with them? Why do you spend so much time with, with people who take you further away from Jesus? Is it because your relationships with them trump your relationship with God? And it's okay to admit that, at least then you're identifying it. But if you're here and you find yourself saying you wish you could be part of a community like that, one that would care for you to bring you closer to Jesus, but you're not part of one or you're not acting like one, then I want you to imagine in your groups tonight what it could look like to move towards becoming a squad like that. Find a squad and be a squad that brings one another to Jesus. That's our hope and dream for you.